Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to take your seats. As we head to day three, the final mile of the Zermatt Summit 2019. Come in, Hans. <laughs> Okay, I think we can start. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Very good, very good. Everybody's still here. Everybody's motivated. Very good. Uh, you might have seen when he came in, I feel like Father Christmas is visiting us every night when we're not here uh, because we, we get gifts uh, all the time. Let me just give you some information about them. Uh, you probably recognized the mushroom on your, on your seats. So uh, the, the, the famous mushroom saga of Zermatt uh, has taken a, a, a great ending. Uh, you see the pasta risotto mix, eco fungi. You all got one of those bags. Uh, we, we already wish you uh, a nice meal, uh, whatever you do with them when you uh, get home. Then we have something very interesting. You all get a pen and a little booklet uh, from the project we heard yesterday quite a lot about, from the stone paper project. Uh, there's a little booklet like this that you can take home. Uh, this is quite fascinating. The pen for it, uh, you'll see, you can write on it and you can erase it again with the eraser here. It actually works. I was already trying this uh, this morning. Uh, so a great project. Take this along with you. Take it home with you. It should be a good reminder of the things that happen here in Zermatt. And of course, we uh, wish that project uh, all the best and we, we, we hope that we can visit uh, that factory in Morocco as quickly as possible as this evolves and this develops as uh, one of the projects that we will remember coming from uh, the Zermatt Summit. I know day three of a conference can be quite, ah, okay, so now we've had two days, uh, I feel like I listen a lot and, and maybe I didn't have time to talk quite as much as I, I, I would have liked to, and that's something we're going to change now. I'm just going to come to you for day three. And that's the moment where people think that's like in the circus, that's why I never sit in the first row, so the clown can come to me. <laughs> the clown is coming to you. Mats, if I just ask you. What? You spent, you spent the conference here. What, what, what impressed you the most, beside your project that we heard all, yesterday? All the, all the inventions, all the ideas, uh, entrepreneurs, ships, and all these things. It's fantastic. It's the first time we are here and invited in by Ginter and Lorenzo. And uh, yeah, it has been a very great time. And everybody, I give you an applause. Oh, I think we can applaud everyone. That's right. And Zermatt is almost as beautiful as Sweden, I would have said, or I would have guessed, right? Uh, let's go. Come, you're sitting in the first row, you have to say something. <laughs> is there someone or something that surprised you a lot here? Um, I think the generosity of everybody participating in uh, just being themselves. Um, integrity, uh -huh. truth, transparency about them. Nice, just good yeah. things, right? Yeah. Very nice. We'll take that along as well. Move over here. That's getting difficult. Uh, who was here for uh, Professor Basti yesterday? I still have some questions about his theory. Maybe someone can explain it to me. No, of course, uh, I'm not asking that. Can I ask you, maybe? Uh, what, what, what has, has marked you? What do you take along from the Zermatt Summit 2019? Take away. Yeah, for me, <coughs> it's, it's a revelation, of course, to, to, to discover the circular economy and all those, uh, those tools and those ideas to create a product. But, um, you know, by design, you already try to understand at what price it should be uh, manufactured so that you can eventually recycle something. Uh -huh. it, it, it's great. I believe it's great. I like this idea. The whole uh, circular economy uh, is a great idea. 
Fantastic. I can promise you, you will hear some more. Uh, today, you will get some more of the projects and some more of the ideas. Uh, maybe a last one, one of you, maybe. Uh, any thoughts? No. Any takeaways? No, it was the first time that you, you were here. And, uh -huh. uh, it was really great. And uh, thanks a lot for to organize uh, that kind of uh, um, event. Event. Yeah, <laughs> That's fantastic. It. I think uh, the thanks goes out to all the organizers and everybody uh, participating today and participating in the last two days and talking about uh, projects. And that's something we're going to do again um, uh, this morning. Uh, we're, we're still in the blue economy mode. And of course, if I say blue economy, we, we, we think of going to Pauli and he's, he's going to take over that, uh, that, uh, that morning a little bit from me. Thank you so much, Gunther. You're taking over my, my job here this morning. We're going to hear from you first uh, a little bit about the, the status quo, where we are at the moment, where we should be going. Because as you know, Gunther once famously said, uh, problems are just opportunities. So if we have any challenges or problems, let's turn them into uh, opportunities and let's see where we can go with this. And then he's got some very interesting guests that he will introduce uh, himself, I would suggest, uh, that, that shows you some, again, some concrete examples. So without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Gunter on stage. Uh, I do have something for you, since you have a very heavy morning. Not just come over. Oops. Since you have a very heavy morning in front of you, why don't you have a coffee from time to time? Uh, don't take three, right? Like Idris. No, 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 no. It would be no. enough, yeah. right? But this has been in your pocket for too long. It's already melted. <laughs> has it turned into coffee yeah, yeah, already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's back to coffee, I think. Yeah. I'll take that from you and I'll leave the stage to you. Please. Thank you so much. Well, what a, what a privilege to be here. You know, when I arrived and started discussing with Christopher what is going to happen here and who is here, I wanted to make very clear to my dear friend Christopher that when you come here to Zermatt, you're visiting family. This is not a community. In communities, when you have a disagreement, you create another community. In a family, you live together. And you live with different opinions and different views. And you agree to disagree, but the love and the cohesion of the family is what keeps you together. And Christopher, I must congratulate you because you were the one who created that family. Thank you. And I do not know how you start your morning, but the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is open that window and smell the air. I don't know, who did that this morning? Smell the air. Isn't it this Zermatt air? <laughs> Amazing. I mean, it is crispy, fresh. And I was unfortunately on the wrong side of the hotel because my view is on tennis courts. <laughs> so I looked up some picture this morning, some digital pleasing picture that allows me to nevertheless have the smell and the flower. But it was the smell and the tennis court this morning. Um, anyway, you know, we, we have to take time to smell. And... How many of you dare to wake up and the first thing you do is look at your phone <laughs> and see what is the latest message or the latest news? Let me tell you something very important. Our eyes are an extraordinary design. But in order for the muscle of our eyes after a night of closure to really be agile and active, not just for today, but for the rest of our life. The moment that you wake up, you need to open up your eyes and you have to look at the horizon. We get the Matterhorn to look at. But you have to look at the horizon. Why? Because it's the greatest relaxation exercise you can do for your eyes. Even if you need glasses, you take them off and you look at that horizon. And when you look at that horizon, your muscles go relax. Because as soon as you do this, your muscles go tension. And therefore, just by taking that one minute to look at the horizon will make your mind relax. Because don't forget that when your pupil in the early morning is just barely opening up to this bright light, it closes down and you're only connecting to five million neurons in your brain. 
But when you're making the exercise to open up that pupil, your brain can get connected to 120 million neurons while relaxing your muscles of your eye. You know, my message in the morning partially is, do we know how our body works? I mean, did you know that you really have to look at the horizon and that you have to relax those eyes? And if you didn't wake up your brain by connecting with 120 million neurons and you stick for the rest of the day with barely 5 million neuron connections, what happens to your day? <coughs> it can't be as rich. It can't be as full. It can't be as creative. It can't be as sensitive. And that is why I wanted to give you that simple advice for the early morning. Next time you wake up, look at the horizon. Try to look outside that window and get some crisp, fresh air. Idris reminded me yesterday of something that I did which uh, had a boomerang effect uh, within an organization called Total. I was invited by the president of Total in Belgium to come and talk about sustainability. So I went in in a yellow jacket. <laughs> and it was uh, tolerated. I haven't been invited back, though. <laughs> but sometimes we have to make, even at my advanced stage of age of 63, sometimes you've got to make a statement and say, it's not possible that every time when I go in the airport, I see these magnificent advertisings of Total. Have you seen it? This incredible saying that they're committed to renewable energies and they're doing all these great things. And then I'm in Argentina, and then I learn in Argentina they're the biggest investors in shale gas. Why, why didn't they add shale gas to these pictures? And when you finally get into the plane, you realize that they have pumped more than $8 billion in shale gas. And that was done with the approval of the president of France. I have nothing against Macron. But I think sometimes this transparency needs to be done. So when I talked about this and did this, look what I got the next time I arrived in Buenos Aires. <coughs> Do you recognize him? I was glad they changed the star to a hummingbird because it's a symbol of our, of our work. But, you know, ladies and gentlemen, what every age you are, we need rebels. Not to take up the arms. We don't need rebels to mobilize the farmers in the highlands of Bolivia. We need rebels who are there to change exactly as the title is of this conference, for the common good. We need rebels. Because doing a little bit less bad is not going to make the difference. And that is why I must share with you what has been to me the greatest inspiration of the year. 1927, a young Frenchman of 27 years old is appointed by Aeropostal to take responsibility for the reception of the planes from Paris who are bringing the airmail to Rio de Janeiro. And he's stationed in a place called Tarfaya, the south of Morocco. And he's flying a breguet. And he's flying this breguet, and since he is in rescue mode, because if the plane goes down somewhere with technical problems, he has to go out and fetch the mail, not worry about the pilot. <coughs> and so he was learning at the age of 27 how to take off and land in the Sahara, in the dunes. And one day, he plays down his plane, and he sees this rock. It was heavy. And then he walked around in the five to ten minutes and found another rock. He collected seven of them. And he sent them to Paris. And three days later, because imagine, in 1927, express mail from Rio de Janeiro to Paris arrives in three days. Mind you, that's the same speed as DHL offers you today. But that arrived and the message came back, you have found seven meteorites from seven different origins. 
Saint-Exupéry was in Tarfaya and he wrote that he was in between two deserts, the Sahara and the Atlantic Ocean. But in 15 minutes, he imagined Le Petit Prince. It took him 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, he imagined a story that's been translated in 335 languages. It still sells over a million copies every year. And it was done in 15 minutes. And he presents an unreasonable prince who asks the unreasonable questions that actually don't make sense but inspires us. So in that world where I found, I met this incredible gentleman who is the local president of the Society for Saint-Exupéry in Tarfaya. And this is the landing strip where Saint-Exupéry was taking off and landing every day, four times. I would like us to go back to the world of Le Petit Prince. Who has read Le Petit Prince? I mean, what should I say? Who has never heard of Le Petit Prince? I mean, Le Petit Prince is read by everyone, inspired by everyone, and is still being read by everyone, and is always referred to, because this is the time in age we have to be unreasonable. We have to ask questions to which we are annoyed to have to answer them, because that is the state of mind that we're requiring. Our friend, is keeping the site active. And this is the little house where Saint-Exupéry was living with four people in complete disarray. It is officially a military area. You're not allowed to go in, but if you know Gunter Pauli, you tell him not to go in, he goes in. <laughs> so I defy the military. And I went in. I was taken out about uh, 20 minutes later, but I was able to take the picture. What we need to do is we need to source ourselves in the moments that are inspiring to us. And they can just be 15 minutes, but they can impact generations for hundreds of years. If you decide to take the time to give it a chance. And that is what I recognize in all the people, so many of the people that are here. And of course, with hardly any resources, they have created Le Musée Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Ladies and gentlemen, when I see that, I can't sit still. I believe that Morocco, with Saint-Exupéry, in between the two deserts, has an extraordinary opportunity to inspire the world. And if I see what is unfolding in the dialogues with OCP, and the leaderships in Morocco that I've been able to meet, I tell you, there is a clear preparedness to not just be a place where tourists could come, but a particular place where we can change the future. I think that we're in desperate need of that freedom to think in 15 minutes that, yes, you can write something that will change the world. Of course, it took Saint-Exupéry another 25 years to crystallize it. But the idea is clearly born in Morocco. But this is how people live there. This is next door. I mean, let's have some dignity. Let's have some openness of the mind. People who have to live next to the place where Saint-Exupéry Imagine this incredible story. We have to be unreasonable again in order to change the future of those people. And that's the same what I saw when I went to Madagascar. I was invited by Madagascar to look at the massive deforestation in the region. And what I always look for is what is the greatness in there that we haven't discovered yet. Just looking at a rock in the Sahara, Saint-Exupéry imagined the greatness of a story. When I was in this visit to Madagascar 
where I had been several times before, I did realize the devastation of the deforestation. It's considered by most of the people irreversible. But then I find this station owned by the government where they keep the original endemic coffees of Madagascar. Now, I had just been with the largest coffee traders in the world in Hamburg, and there they had said, Madagascar is off the coffee map. We have closed our offices. There is no future there. Ladies and gentlemen, when someone tells you, with all the science, knowledge, and market information, there's no future, scrap that data. Scrap it. Because if we're going to listen to the data of the market researchers and the experts and the people who have that vision, ladies and gentlemen, you become a banker. You just manage money in accounts. What we're in need of is to scrap it and say, in a hundred years down the road, we can change that reality of today. And you don't change the reality of today by making a, de making a detailed analysis of the problem of today and the analysis of today. You create the vision in which you're asking questions to which everyone tells you it's unreasonable to even ask it. When I was visiting this place, which is, by the way, an 18-hour gruesome drive from the airport, when I got there and we walked into this 18-hectare site that was set up by the French in 1958. We identified 41 varieties of endemic coffees of Madagascar that have no caffeine. Bing! I only need one second to hear that. You know how you make caffeine-free coffee today? I mean, you shouldn't drink this. This is a chemical cocktail. But you have no more caffeine, but you like to have the smell. But what we realized is that the insects attack the coffee, and the fungus attacks the coffee. And the smartness of the real intelligence of nature is that nature develops a complex molecule called caffeine, which is basically an insecticide and a herbicide. But when the plant realized that with this insecticide and, and, and herbicide, the bugs and the fungus didn't come back. It said, why should I keep on producing it? They think I have it. So in Madagascar is the only part of the world, due to its unique biodiversity, that the plants stopped producing caffeine because it was needed anymore. And all the bugs thought they had it, so they didn't come anymore. Because they thought they had learned their lesson. You know what it is? 41 varieties of caffeine-free coffee. I now take one of my hat as an, as an entrepreneur. That means that I can offer caffeine-free, bio-grown, at 30% of the cost of what they have today, chemically removing the caffeine. Is this a nice way to start business? Do we need a detailed analysis now? We don't need any detailed analysis. We just need to realize that this is there. But how much time are we spending on discovering the uniqueness of nature? How much time, how much have you read about the opportunity to really take something that is endemic, local, natural, and turn it into a product? Now, this variety is one of our favorite ones. It was saved in 1962, lost for all these times. And we now have engaged in a 25-year program to get at least 10, 20 hectares going again. And we're going to go for all 41 varieties. And, and I was very grateful for Mr. Giuseppe Lavazza, not to mention it, but he is helping us with the typification of the taste of all these coffees. <coughs> and I think that's the leadership of Giuseppe. He doesn't even talk about it. He just does it. That is leadership. Just do it. Don't talk about it. He gave an official speech. We need to sit down with him next year and get the heart because this is what is behind all of that. And that's because if you're in the community for the first time, you don't feel comfortable. But once you're a member of the family, you can talk. What I think is so important is that we see a strategy for Madagascar to become a key player in a niche market, which is nevertheless a very important. It's a multi-billion dollar business, the caffeine-free coffee. 
But if we do that, we can regenerate the forests of Madagascar because this caffeine free only grows under a canopy. And the 30% difference we can reinvest locally to generate the forests. We have the need to rediscover the ingenious inventions of the past. The yo-yo was invited, invented by the Greeks. They put two gods on the side, and a young boy had to learn how to lift the gods. That's what the yo-yo is, lifting the gods. And you had to learn how to do that forever. And when you turn from, from a young boy into a man, you know how to lift the gods and you don't play with a yo-yo anymore. It's amazing, we still do the same. Kids learn how to play the yo-yo and when they grow up, no more yo-yo. But the amazing thing is that yo-yo has a built-in artificial intelligence in our mind because it connects the brain to a click in the hand. And we all know that the champions who are doing that are able to do with yo-yos the most incredible things because they know how to do the click. Now that clicking needs to go into artificial intelligence. Just like we have this incredible opportunity to kite. When, who, who has not played with a kite? We all play with a kite. Who has not played with a yo-yo? We all play with a yo-yo. But the kite was invented 9,000 years ago in Indonesia. It's not a Chinese invention. And the kite was also a way to get to the gods. But what do you do to launch a kite? We all know, you got to run or pull. And what do you do when you run and pull? You create your own wind. Wow! As a child, you learn to coordinate this device by creating your own wind. Now, that is what we need to reinvent. Did you know you're making your own wind when you... Uh, did, did your dad said, well, in order to lift the kite, you're now going to make your own wind. We were never told that. But once you are there and you see it's lifting, you pull and you get a bit sophisticated to get with two or with four. But we know how to create our own wind. It's in our human DNA. We know how to do it. And that is why I appreciate so much the sky sails. That's why I need to see leadership going back to bring the yo-yo and the kite with artificial intelligence and robots and make certain that we build on what humanity has been developing for 9,000 years. This kind of thinking that needs to be combined with mechanics. Who has a Google clock at home? I mean, isn't this amazing? You have this little weight in this acorn, you pull it, it takes you two seconds, and for eight days, you have a perfect modulation of power. Eight days. This was done in 1620. This is not Bavarian. This is not Swiss. This is Baden-Württemberg. The Schwaben. You know, they are the ones who developed it. But the capacity to take gravity and turn it into a perfect modulated movement of tic-tac, tic-tac, for eight days. Wow. What a genius. And this is how I try to bring these incredible innovations into a context of saying, this is a technology that will carry us into the future because it is grounded into something that humanity has been doing for centuries. And then we know that we have what is required to take it forward. I'm just taking this picture Stefan, you know, because it was for me so obvious when I was in the Lux Hotel that, you know, the last, uh, last one should become a kite. And, you know, and that powers the hotel. You know, it's so obvious. But now I can do edutainment. I am imagining that this place is going to be the place where we're teaching everyone again to play with a kite and the yo-yo. And how that can then power 500 homes or 2,000 families with a 40 square meter sail. 40 square meter. Using 5% of the material that today a windmill requires. Why would we even think about that anymore? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Of course, Vestas will not agree with me. <laughs> Vestas will think that this is heresy. 
And it is. It is a rebellion. Because it doesn't make sense that you have a windmill where you require a break when the wind is too strong and power to get it going. I mean, haven't you learned the yo-yo? And haven't you learned the kite and the cuckoo's clock? I mean, where is engineering now? And this is how I go around the world discovering. I was just last week in Guilin, who's been to this incredible place, Guilin. Guilin is, is one of the marvels of China. But when the Chinese government takes me to Guilin, I'm asking about what grows here, what is here that is unique. I'm not looking at rocks. Well, uh, I, I leave that to Henry. Henry Li Yang, he will look at the rocks and see if he can turn it into paper. I don't do that. But when you're in Guilin, you find this fruit. Who knows the monk fruit? Wonderful. The monk fruit is the sweetest fruit in the world. It is the only fruit with zero calories in the sweetness that is now certified sweetener, natural certified sweetener for diabetic patients. The only one. It's a gift of nature. And so I want to understand why is this only growing in Guilin? It's just the same reason why are the, the black truffles only in Piemonte? I mean, why? Because we've tried to do it everywhere else and it doesn't work very well. But in Guilin, they have a soil which has a unique fungus. And it's the fungus who's doing the job. That's the kind of discoveries that we are requiring. Because they've tried to transpose the flower, the fruit everywhere. Because guess what? We like to farm this in America with aquaponics, in the soil, with genetics. It doesn't work. Our genetics cannot copy the ecosystem that created this unique soil thanks to millions of years of erosions with this variety of fungus that just is refusing to grow everywhere else. It is from Guilin and it'll stay in Guilin. But this is a gift from nature. Could we finally have people who have diabetes, a sugar, that has zero calories and makes you feel comfortable and happy? And it's a fruit. It's a gift from nature. C'est un cadeau de Dieu. It is just a gift. And do we discover it? Yes. So I have an agreement, I was able last week to have an agreement with China that this fruit which grows on a vine will go from 1 billion units to 2 billion units to 10 billion units. And basically I've mobilized a friend in Japan who is financing the extraction of the pure sugar, which is 300 times sweeter naturally than sugar. You know, we are in desperate need of discoveries. So when I launched the fable in China, who is the sweetest? We had it immediately approved, and it's gone to 735,000 schools in China. China would like first the Chinese to have access to this fruit before they sell it anywhere else in the world. I learned to know an incredible woman, Ai Futaki. Who has heard of Ai Futaki? Ai Futaki is the world record holder of swimming free dive in caves, longest distance. She can hold her breath for six minutes and swim. But she doesn't just swim. She goes and swim with the whales, with the sharks. And what we need to know is that all we have the risk of one day being in a moment of crisis and that moment will be we drop, fall into the water and there's a current we have to hold our breath or there's a fire and we have to hold our breath. <coughs> She's trained herself to hold her breath by ensuring that we relax the brain. Because the brain, when we are normally living, consumes 20% of our oxygen. But the moment that we're under stress, we could consume up to 40% of the oxygen and that's why we faint under stress. We're just taking out too much oxygen. But it's the brain that's doing it because we're stressed. We have anxiety. So she trained herself to be without anxiety. And I, I can guarantee you, if you want to swim with the whales, with the sharks like that, you better not have anxiety. But then she realized that not having the bottles, not having 
the opportunity to breathe and having this control, all the animals around her in the water relax. It's an amazing experience how she can dance with the whales. And the male whale goes clearly into a courtship with her. He's clearly courting her. And she can make him dance and move for three, four minutes by just being there. The whale makes her movements. You know, we hardly are able to talk to each other around the world because we're forced to use English all the time. But, you know, can we talk to animals? Can we understand the other sentient beings that are around us? I mean, she took on the challenge to swim with alligators. And she had the amazing effect that the alligator kind of liked to hold hands with her. Is this unreasonable? This is absolutely unreasonable. This doesn't make any sense to anyone. Yeah, that's what Le Petit Prince has been telling us. Don't be reasonable. Ask the questions. And if that is possible, you know, we can go very far. I had the great privilege, thanks to Jean-Luc, to go and swim with the cachalot, with the sperm whales. But when I was there in Mauritius, swimming with these incredible... This is my picture. This is, I, I took that one with my GoPro. This as well. You know... They're talking to each other. I mean, I launched to the children in China now the challenge that would you like to learn how to talk to the whales or would you like to learn French? And unfortunately, Suat, I took French as an example. I, I, I should have taken, you know, you know, an obscure, strange language. But, and it was amazing. All the kids said, talk to the whales. Because if you're five, six years old, talking to the whales inspires you. Talking to the French, if you haven't met them yet, <laughs> maybe not as much. You know, <laughs> I cannot tell to the five, six year olds they have to do a French kiss, Marco. <laughs> we have to take a step back and discover nature. Discover nature. How does it work? And this is one of the things I'm sure many of you, you can see it on a video on YouTube, but this is to me one of the incredible things. When they reintroduced the wolves into Yellowstone, the rivers changed. Now, that is what we are in need of. We're in a world of the internet where we have something that is called instant gratification. You ask, you have millions of answers. You don't even care that the first answers you get have been paid for. So we're living in a world where you pay, you get paid for doing instant gratification. What we need urgently is logic. This is what Socrates was teaching people. We need logic. We need connecting dots. We need to see that when there is indeed no wolf around, that at that moment... They will be overgrazing by the elks and the deer. And when they overgraze around the rivers, of course the rivers will have the physical effect of erosion much faster than before. But when the wolves are reintroduced, the riverbeds are full with grass again. Because somehow the wolf knows how many he should eat every year to keep nature in an incredible dynamic balance. Incredible dynamic balance. And we have to take up the responsibility to connect the dots. We have to realize that when you do something, yes, the butterfly effect is there. You may do something tiny, but it has effects that we do not understand because we have become addicted to instant gratification. Ask a question, have the answer. Seconds, millions of answers, which we never look at. So to me, it was one of the great experiences being in Reunion Island to sit down with the scientists and to understand what happened when the lava went into the ocean. And of course, the first news that many of you will have seen was the devastation of the corals. And news doesn't follow up. 
CNN doesn't stay long enough. Sorry, Urs, uh, you know. CNN comes and goes. And when it's crisis, they're there. When everything is settling again, they're gone. But what we have learned was an amazing experience. Because three weeks later, the corals were blooming again, like never in history has been seen. And the scientist, Jean Pourcotte, has been studying them, diving with them, going into the water, sensing where is the wall of heat, and how the corals actually were able to have a divorce from the microalgae with whom they live in symbiosis. And it's the microalgae that couldn't survive the heat. The coral could take it for several days and weeks, but not the microalgae. So the microalgae died and we thought it was crisis. But we didn't understand that when you have this heat, you create currents. And currents came all the way from Australia. And those microalgae, which are naturally resisting the heat at a much higher temperature, found corals that were in desire to be in partnership again. The divorce led to a new marriage, and the new marriage has now corals which are ready for the test of climate change. So we have now started organizing something we call the coral sauna. <coughs> a sauna, you know, you go and sit and heat up, and then you go cold again. We have now, in four places around the world, initiated what we discovered in nature. You have the corals in hot water, warm water, give them the shock, the microalgae die, and then you let natural selection do the job. It works. I hate to see these dramas every time again about the corals going, going in a disaster. It is a disaster. But if we solely focus on the disaster, we're not getting anywhere in this world. And we do not have to think that we need to understand the genetics and we have to understand the chemistry. No, the first thing we have to do is understand how nature's evolutionary path works. Because nature is always on an evolutionary path. On the little island of Bonaire, we started now seven years ago with this regeneration of coral initiative. Now we can complement that initiative with the divorce and the remarriage of the coral with the microalgae. A student of mine in Australia has launched the initiative in Brisbane, has been awarded with it, and it brings us to one discovery after the other. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going through a crisis at many different levels. And the crisis is not we're polluting, we're crisis is because we're ignorant about what we're doing and we don't take the time to learn. We have taken just the time to put a like. That's it. We have denigrated into a culture of likes and we measure our ego with likes. Now, this little worm is not measuring its ego in likes. But this little worm which dug the hole, and which we know is eating a lot of microplastics at the same time, and we'll come back to that later on, everyone has seen this on a beach. If you don't have those worms anymore, these sea worms, on the beach, your ecosystem is in collapse, because they're everywhere. But they have learned how to absorb oxygen into their blood. They're a worm, we don't recognize them, but they have blood, they have hemoglobin. And their hemoglobin is able to sequester 150 times more oxygen than our hemoglobin is able to do. Franck Zal, the great French scientist, I'm convinced he will get a Nobel Prize for this. This incredible discovery of being able to have a hemoglobin that is neutral to the different type of bloods will help you give the shot of oxygen that today, in the trials, will make it possible to extend the transplanted heart or liver or lung from hours 
to days. We now have the time to do the perfect matches, thanks to the blood of a worm. We cannot limit the search and the worms today on microplastics only. We have to go into the details of how nature works and how it will inspire us. Because this is a drama, and we'll come back to that later with Marco in a lot of detail. But we need to not stop there. We need to create a context that allows us to see these amazing opportunities in the midst of the shit we're in. Because I don't know how you call this, but to me this is S-H-I-T. And we have to start understanding how those microplastics get into anything. In anything. And that is why we need to see that those fleece jackets from recycled pet bottles we were also excited about a few years ago. One of the major contributors of microplastics in the ocean. My dear friend Yvon Chouinard, who has committed so much with Patagonia to sustainability, had a shock of his life when he realized that it was his initiative to use fleece jackets from recycled pet bottles that can now be traced back into the Bay of San Francisco. I mean, we have made a mess, but no one can say that Yvon Chouinard didn't have the best of intentions. And that is why we're in need to have this capacity of flexibility and ask the unreasonable questions. But we need science. We need to have solid science. And solid science in biology is genetics. Every child, every young man and girl that learns today biology in the first year is taught how to do genetic manipulation. Excuse me? E excuse me? Could we just first understand how it works? <laughs> you know, I mean, could we just take a moment to just understand how nature works before we start manipulating genes? And I think when I was working with the Danish Technical University in Copenhagen, and they showed me the details of how the absorption is working on the seaweeds. And of course this is affecting the food market and the crisis in food because people don't want to eat microplastics. And even though seaweeds are a very healthy food, we now know where it sticks, how it sticks, and how it is getting on there, and how it keeps on coming on there. And those researchers were very helpful to understand that you cannot remove all by just using hot water to spray your seaweeds. You need to do something else with it. And that research, when it was submitted to me, got, of course, my thinking into a quick mode related to the seaweeds, related to the seagrasses, and to the opportunity to start understanding which are the seaweeds that are best absorbing the microplastics. Now, when we got into Morocco, the discussions on the seaweed farming, our original intention was not microplastics. But when the science emerges and the detail is in front of you, then we quickly studied and we found that, amongst others, this seaweed from the southern Moroccan coasts, next to where saint Exupéry was living, that that is an extraordinary adsorber, not absorber. It just sticks to the outside. Now, this is the beauty. In nature, we are ingesting seaweeds, leave the plastics on the outside. Good news. But the question is, of course, what do you do with all these seaweeds that have that capacity? Well, here you see the first curtain that was pulled up in Connecticut, United States. You know, we use curtains as a principle. You know, when we want to shut something off, the light, curtain. We want to sleep all night, curtain. Nature has curtains as well. When you create curtains, you can create the blockage. But we cannot remove all the plastics, not in a year's time that we have already pumped in there. And we can certainly cannot take them out with the mess that we're still continuing to ship down to the ocean through rivers and our own mismanagement of wastewater. We're in need of focusing where it is more sensitive. And that is where, in Japan, I learned about a dramatic story. 
for the Japanese. The gold-crested ibis, which is the symbol of the emperor, the national bird of Japan, was down to four birds. Japan made a national effort only as the Japanese can do, and they found the birds all around the world. They crossbred them, and after 25 years, they had 23 birds again, at a cost of one million per bird. And then one died. And they looked at what happened. They didn't find it. Then they did a full autopsy, like you would do in a criminal case. Well, for a million dollars, of course, you would do that. They realized that the liver of the bird was blocked with microplastics. You couldn't see it. You really had to do an autopsy. So what we are now looking at is creating those nets that allow us to have these curtains, which are not the solution for tomorrow, but we think it is a first step in a process that allows us to think a hundred years ahead. Now, now, when I make a proposal to an investor in Europe, a hundred years is when you will see the results, they will say, are you nuts? But a couple hundred years ago, we had no problem of investing in cathedrals, knowing that it would take two, three hundred years to build it. So we used to be patient with our capital. And we don't have that patience anymore. China and Japan loves the 100-year horizon. And I think that when we look at the details of how the seaweed company is creating these opportunities, of having these seaweeds farmed, but of course, what do you do with it? I'm not going to show the video. But what we need to see is that we are inundated on the world market with shale gas. And I would like you to, with me to connect the dots. That is what we need, connect the dots. How do you fight shale gas? You can't, because Total has put up the 8 billion. Canada does it for 25 years. America is moving ahead with it. So don't think you can stop it by holding banners. That doesn't mean you don't have to hold up the banners, but you have to have multiple strategies. And the only strategy to move is be cheaper. Be cheaper is only possible when you have multiple cash flows, multiple benefits. So when you start with the logic of growing the seaweeds, taking them out, turning them into biogas, then the biogas anaerobically leaves you a solid, and that solid is 3% only. But that biogas and the solid, that solid is 50% phosphates. I come back to our friends from OCP. Would it be possible to be so unreasonable to think that we can get phosphates from the seaweeds that are capturing the microplastics while going for a fuel that is carbon neutral? being cheaper than shale gas. Do you see the connected dots? Now, do you tell me it's not possible? Then I'm asking you, leave the room. Get out of here. I don't want to have the people who say yes, but. We need to start with the energies where the logic is strong and we see that it can move and move. You know, just like my friends in Latvia. When I show this picture in Latvia, two years ago, the director of forestry said, you're absolutely right. I never understood that when we fish a female with all the eggs in there, we're dramatically reducing the capacity to regenerate our lakes with fish. So he launched the initiative. It's the only country in the world that is asking the fishermen to learn the difference between a male and a female. Ladies and gentlemen, could we be as basic of understanding nature as knowing what is a male and a female? <laughs> Have you ever looked at two fishes? Do you know what is a male and what is a female? I think there will not be more than five people in this room who ever thought about the difference of a male and a female fish. And when she's pregnant, are you one of those Scandinavians who loves to eat the lyrum? The eggs? I mean, I think this is insane, to be very honest. We're talking about beluga and, and, and we talk about uh, caviar, but we are continuously killing off the females with eggs. 
And then we say, oh, we have overfishing. No, 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 no. You don't have overfishing. You have the killing of the females, the mothers, the grandmothers with the eggs in their belly. And of course we completely disturb the ecosystem when we do that. So when you take a picture in Latvia on one of their beautiful lakes and you caught a female, you take a picture of her, you release her, you get a cup for free. <laughs> This summer, I was told that the first 10,000 cups were delivered. Now, I would just like you to do a little mathematics. 10,000 cups with 50,000 eggs. And we know not all the eggs are converted to beautiful little fishes. So what do we focus on? Ah, these small males who are useless, you know. Let me conclude. What you have just seen is 50% of my time. Discover. I'm on a path of discovery, and I want to be on that path for the rest of my life. I would like you to start rediscovering life. Life out there, life in here. But the life in here requires inspiration. We need to be inspired. And inspiration for me is telling stories. If we are not learning again to tell stories to the kids, if you think that by having Pokemon as your babysitter, I mean, we are really not serving humanity. I do not know why, but the Chinese government is the only government in the world that has decided to adopt our pedagogy of telling stories to children as a nationwide strategy for education. And the government takes me to all types of settings of schools. And it also takes me to the normal universities. This is where 50,000 teachers are trained in a university. I'm asked to teach the teachers how to tell stories. I never thought I was a storyteller. I never thought I was a story writer. I never had that in one of my objectives for life. But what we have to learn in life is navigate. Go with the flow. Don't try to be the current. If you try to be the current, you will tire yourself out and get heart attacks, cancers. You need to go with the flow and discover the flows that are there. And I didn't know this flow in China with their desire to go to education. Last Monday, just last Monday, I was in the birthplace of Mao Zedong on the day that he passed away, the 9th of September. And the museum was open for me. And they said, we need better education than he imagined with his little red book. I'm taking to schools that were established in 1262. I'm taking to schools where kids welcome me on arrival. I'm taking to schools where little boys and girls of five, six-year-olds are going for the first day. And yes, they are telling me what they've learned, that when the poo from the bird gives you a healthy tree. And that's done by the three-year-olds. Or how horses have healthy bones. And how the spider is the greatest recycler because it will always recycle on the spot its whole web. And when the kids get the chance, they can ask me questions. I have two-hour sessions with two-hour questions. We go four hours in a row. It's insane. I don't know how the kids can do it. Four hours in a row, non-stop. You mean, they're so eager. And then... I'm taking to a museum. Have you ever heard of the city of Liu Sao? It's only two and a half million inhabitants. And they're the city that launches the electric car of China, which you can buy for list price $7,000, and you can get it with subsidies for $4,000, a two-seater for $4,000. And the more you use the car electrically, with the more people in your neighborhood, the lower electricity rates you pay. What is the result? This is the city with the largest number of electric cars in the world. In no time. And the city has decided that there are only so many cars that can be in the city. And everyone has to apply for a license. And if you have a car that is more than 10 years old, 
it has to leave the road. And if you buy a new one that's a diesel, a Mercedes or a Lexus, you go in a lottery to get a license plate. A lottery. If you buy an electric car, you get the license plate on the spot. China is doing things that somehow not even CNN reports on. No one reports on this. No one. And I think this is what we're missing. We're not only not understanding what nature is doing and functioning, we don't even listen and find out what China is doing. And if you like it or if you don't like it, they're determining our common future. I'm concluding with this little story, which has become the most popular story in China of my fables. It's more than nine zeros, the number of copies that have been distributed in China. And it's about the master and the grandmaster. How do you, as a great teacher, inspire children? What do you get back? You get back children who are inspired. And children who are inspired will go for the research, will learn how to work with their emotions, figure out how to do it in teams, get it translated into action. And of course, when kids do that, they get enthused. And who do they talk to? To the parents and to the teachers. Education is not long term, one generation down the road. Education is now. Because when the kids are inspired and see their dream and going for implementation, those kids change the world. And then the teacher who becomes a depository of all that good, inspiring, extraordinary drive towards doing things. Because Jean Piaget said that the children are little scientists. You get it wrong. Children are little entrepreneurs. They don't make hypotheses. Children, children do. But when the teacher gets this, he turns into a master. And the master is getting now teachers as his students. And the students give the same input. And the students will become eventually a master. And when the students become master, the master becomes a grandmaster. He doesn't become a grandmaster because he's the genius. He becomes the depository of the dynamics in society, of having children that are inspired. And that is why we need to talk about education and the action related to it. Ladies and gentlemen, as you have sensed, I could go on for hours and hours. In China, they let me do that. I don't know why. Probably they've been obliged by the party to listen to me for at least four hours before they can go for lunch or for dinner. But. China is making a great impact. You are making a great impact. Everyone is making a great impact. And if we are people who take us a mission in life to inspire, you will become master and grandmaster. Because inspiration is not giving. Inspiration is listening to what happened with that inspiration. And this is the future. Inspire others so you can be inspired forever. And if you have been inspired forever, and you moved on as a master and a grandmaster, you're ready for eternity. Thank you. Thank you.